Good evening, everybody. It's Ghosty on the Road, and I thought tonight, in honor of Ron DeFore being on the program, that I would talk for a moment about my fandom of his father, Don DeFore. You know, one of my favorite television shows ever, it certainly would be in my top ten, is The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. And I think it's a show that, for many people, is somewhat misunderstood. I often see it mentioned in the same breath as Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best, as, you know, the nuclear family in suburbia and the problems are solved by the end of every episode. That's not quite true, because The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet is maybe a little more existential, if you want to use a highfalutin word, than something like Father Knows Best. Because in The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, Ozzie does not know best. Usually Ozzie's idea is the worst idea and it's up for the it's up to the boys and for harriet to figure out how to uh, solve a problem that ozzy only makes worse and one of the great joys of the show is ozzy's relationship with next door neighbor thorny played by don DeFord, one of my favorite characters and i like the fact that thorny is always kidding oz so it starts off Usually a scene where Thorny appears to be angry or a little ticked off at Ozzy. And then, you know, he it's all building to a joke. And then Thorny breaks into that big, beautiful smile. And there's a lot of laughs. And Ozzy realizes, too. And that's kind of their relationship. It's competitive. You know, they get into a lot of uh, battles, suburban battles with each other. You know, who could have, you know, the cleanest backyard or something like that. And uh, and sometimes it's even a little passive aggressive, you know, but it's an interesting relationship. The show itself has been, I, I use the word existential, it's been compared, not just by me, but by other people to Seinfeld. You know, it's a show that is not about big themes, but it's about these little moments in life that we all can relate to. These are not, you know, very special episodes, you know, when we think about television in the 80s, you know, they have very special episodes where they deal with these heavy uh, topics like, uh, you know, drug abuse or anything. It's nothing like that. You know, these these would all be episodes that were about Ozzy trying to escape embarrassment for some social faux pas, you know, and Thorny would be there to uh, rib him. Great stuff. Just wonderful. And then years later, now, of course, uh, people love rightly so, Don DeFore in uh, Hazel. You know, that's certainly a huge uh, mo uh, television show, rather, in his repertoire. But it was a few years ago that I found out, because I had no idea that Don DeFore was a serious dramatic actor, in addition to being uh, a likable uh, comic actor, because I again, we think of him in Hazel, we think of him on The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, and I went to a revival house one night, and they showed Too Late for Tears, 1949, a movie with uh, Don DeFore and Elizabeth Scott, and he really impressed me in that, because I, I just kept expecting him to be kind of funny, because that's how I just pictured Don DeFore, but he, he wasn't, he was, he was serious, he was doing a great job in this film noir, you know, to be honest. And it really showed that he had much more to him than, you know, being a lovable comic actor, which would have been enough, you know, would have been enough for, for anybody. But he just had so much. Craig Radio, you're on Craig there. Oh, uh, yeah, this is Ron DeFore. Hi, Ron, how are you? Uh, is this Tiffany? This is Tiffany, how are you? Good, I'm doing fine. I'm, How about you? I'm great, I'm great. Well, let me do the official introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an author and the son, one of a few, of the beloved, beloved actor Don DeFore. We are very excited to welcome the one and only Ron DeFore to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Ron. Well, thanks. I'm glad to be with you and your large audience. <laughs> well, Ron, this is Terry. Uh, I usually lead the interviews. Unfortunately, it's been a bad week for me. I don't know if you can hear or not. I'm losing my voice. It's the old <laughs> disc jockey curse. So I'm going to have to let the most of the questions come from my daughter, Tiffany. 
Well, having been a disc jockey in one of my 20 careers, I completely understand. <laughs> I had to do a magic show one time where my assistant was the governor of Illinois. He was running for president at the time. I lost my voice then. I had to do the whole thing in pantomime. <laughs> <laughs> I told Terry, I was like, that doesn't really work on radio. No. So. <laughs> right. Yeah, a good voice for radio. Right. Well, let's start out. I wanted to start out by talking about your book. Uh, we talked about it a little bit at the start of the show, uh, but you wrote a book called Growing Up in Disneyland. Uh, so this sounds like every child's dream, but maybe not for somebody who's there every single day. Tell us a little bit about the book and, and, and why, what, what happened? Why did you write it? What is this, what is this all about? Well, uh, first of all, my dad, uh, television, uh, Broadway, feature film, and stage actor and star, Don DeFore, and my life growing up in a celebrity family. And uh, the f first uh, caution I need to give is uh, the title does not mean it's all about Disneyland. Out of out of the many w wonderful five star reviews I've gotten on Amazon, unfortunately, there's three of them that uh, didn't like the book because they thought it was all about Disneyland. So I <laughs> I have three chapters in there. The, the The title is a metaphor for my life, but it's also literal in that my dad was the only person to own a food establishment inside of Disneyland bearing the name of a real person. Right, and that was, of course, for listeners who don't know, that was Don DeFore's Silver Banjo Barbecue. Um, how did, do you know anything about how that came about? I mean, knowing that it was one of the only, or the only restaurant that bared a person's name. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Tinkerbell's Cafe. It was a person. So did this spawn out of a friendship between your dad and Walt, or, or how did this happen? Yes, and I, I have all of this in my book. And by the way, a lot of my book, the first part, is in my dad's own words. I, I kept his memoirs that were never published and never thought I'd do anything with them until I decided to write a book, and I thought it was a perfect place to showcase uh, his interpretation of uh, his many productions and <laughs> the restaurant Disneyland. So that happened, uh, and I need to back up a little bit with a, a piece of uh, Dad's history mm -hmm. uh, that is little known, unless you read the book, um, and I think is one of the greatest accomplishments in uh, television, and that is that my dad was the president of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences in 1954, and he was the first person to be successful in selling the national broadcast of the Emmy Awards to NBC. Wow. Uh, with that success, he was voted in for a second term. So he, he actually served uh, two years as uh, the Academy president. But what happened after that success, in, in fact, the... Uh, most recent 70 year anniversary of the Emmy Awards show where they did like a five minute uh, video tribute tribute to uh, its history uh, started off with my dad in his tux uh, opening up that <laughs> first national uh, broadcast but anyway so uh, there were dozens of people uh, sending him telegrams uh, calling him with congratulations and one of those people was uh, Walt Disney and oh. uh, as my dad describes in the book, he said, uh, Walt called and said, you know, Don, you, you know, I was on the board uh, for a couple of years there, and we couldn't give the show away. He said, so <laughs> I want to meet the guy that was able to sell it. So he invited my dad out to uh, uh, Burbank Studios, gave him a personal tour, and, and uh, a couple of the sound stages were highly guarded, but he took uh, my dad through, and it... Uh, they contained a lot of the animatronics that were soon to go into uh, Disneyland the following year. So fast forward to uh, Disneyland's opening day, July 17, 1955. Uh, the entire DeFore family was in the opening day parade. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have some pictures uh, of that. In fact, one of the, the pictures on the uh, front of the book is of our family in the little Autopia cars uh, riding up uh, Main Street in the opening day parade. And two years later, uh, actually about a year and a half later, um, Walt had some uh, space open in Frontierland, had heard uh, stories from my dad about him cooking his way through Pasadena Playhouse uh, 
School of Theater and, and said, hey, I know, I know you know uh, food, so how would you like to open up a barbecue place? Wow. So uh, I'm trying to get a few questions here. So did your dad actually cook in a restaurant? Uh, no, he, he cooked at, uh, he was one of very few people that got a scholarship to the Pasadena uh, Playhouse School of Theater uh, in the uh, 1930s. And uh, didn't have a lot of money, so one of his part-time jobs was cooking at the, the school there. Now, I guess Walt Disney liked the restaurant so much, he ate there, and, and that's a fact. But I want to know, did your dad charge him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I doubt it. <laughs> and it, it was not only a great place to eat, but uh, my uncle, my dad's brother, uh, Vern, managed the place and i remember Vern always saying oh you missed uh, walt you know this is this is uh, walt's favorite part of the park and i i was at the park a lot and and was there a couple times when walt was there and he would sit out on the patio that faced uh the tom sawyer's island and the the two river boats and he would sketch uh you know uh, the uh uh, the various uh, ships there and the, the landscape, and I, I'm just sorry I didn't keep one of the <laughs> sketches. Right. Well, you know, that kind of brings up an interesting question, Ron, and maybe you can tell me from what your dad might have shared with you, but also what <clears throat> you might remember from being a child. Uh, obviously, when you're a child, memories are a little bit different, but we always hear storied tales of icons in Hollywood. Walt Disney's one, and, and another one I'll mention when we get there a little bit later tonight is, of course, Ozzie Nelson. And their reputation often precedes them. Some people say they were wonderful. Some people say, oh, well, no, but they were, you know, shrewd businessmen and they were difficult to be around or be difficult to work with. What was your experience or your remembrances of Walt and also your dad's? Uh, they're limited because of my age. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, Ozzy, because uh, Dad uh, was on the show, actually every uh, episode uh, from the beginning, 1952 to 57. Um, and although, you know, I was on the set a couple of times, uh, the Nelsons were over at our house, we were over at theirs. Uh, you know, I was born in 1950, so, you know, I was in, you know, at best four, five, six years old. So I remember them, but they're they're vague memories. Uh, on on Ozzy, what I do recall from you know many conversations with my dad years later, is Dad really respected him. And, and of course now when I look back on uh, the show and, and and see the brilliant direction, the brilliant writing, which was all done by Ozzy and his brother. Mm -hmm. um, he reminds me, again, from what my dad would tell me, uh, uh, of a guy that I did work for in my adult life, Steve Allen. I, I was the associate director of the Steve Allen Show. Um, and they're very similar. They're geniuses uh, and they're perfectionists. And they're not always easy to work with, but their product is always brilliant. And, and the, the two were very similar in that way. Now we had uh, Barry Livingston from My Three Sons on, and he used to be on the Ozzy and Harriet show all the time. And he was totally, I don't want to say enamored, he, he was obsessed with Ricky <laughs> Nelson. Because here Ricky Nelson was becoming this big rock star and everything. Did you know Ricky much? And were you a fan of his music? And did you kind of follow him around like, like old Ernie did from My Three Sons? Um, no, unlike... Uh, maybe many people in, in Hollywood, and again, I write about this in the book, I was never enamored <laughs> with any stars. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, even Walt Disney or, or Ozzy and, and Steve Allen, although I, I really respected them, enjoyed working with them. Um, but that's one thing that I just never had, because they, they were all neighbors. Yeah. So right. I... You know, they they weren't any uh, different to me, just, uh, you know, regular people. I like that answer. Right. I like that. Now, you had mentioned earlier that there was, a, which is true, There was a, there's a lot of things that people don't know about your dad. I mean, everybody, of course, focuses on <clears throat> him playing Thorny from Ozzy and Harriet, Mr. B from Hazel. But there's a lot of things that he did, even politically, that people didn't know uh, about him. Was that kind of what made you decide to write growing up in Disneyland, because uh, Don actually did write his own memoirs as well, right? That was Hollywood Before and After? Yeah, but it was never published. So my ah. brother and I, 
for uh, what forty years have had uh, a, an electronic version from computer to computer, and we had discussed decades ago. You know, uh, let's not touch it. You know, it it, it needed a lot of editing. It was uh, way too long. It was over eight hundred pages. So it just kind of sat there. And but to answer your question. What there's two things that really encouraged me. One, I established on Facebook uh, a group uh, <laughs> near the beginning of Facebook. It's been out there for a long time. The Don DeFore Fan Club, and and I've got uh, hundreds, if not a, a couple few thousand uh, members that are really dedicated. And and it it uh, it blows me away. Even to this day, I'll go on it, and how many people really loved my dad and so over the years seeing how many people and, and knowing that you know on any Facebook group you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg right. and then not only that but then uh, for more than 20 years my brother and I have given presentations to various uh, Disney enthusiast enthusiast groups including the uh, the big ABC Disney uh, biannual uh, convention down in Anaheim, the D23. We did the original D23 and then did one a few years later on the restaurant because we came to learn how loved that really unique piece of Disneyland history is, especially among those that really follow it. So after these presentations, you know, people were actually coming up for mine and my brother Dave's autograph and saying, wow, you guys have so many stories. You should write a book. You should write a book. Well, I was busy, busy building my business in uh, Washington, D.C. and had no time to do that. But when I retired, started going into semi-retirement, I thought, you know what? I have the time and I love to write. And bingo, that's when it happened. Well, I'm so glad your dad escaped possible publicity that wouldn't have been, you know, anything to have hurt him. But if your dad's restaurant was still alive and we were still back in those days. I guess because of it being politically correct, they would have come down on it. Your dad's restaurant was next to Aunt Jemima's restaurant. Is that right? <laughs> right, which is now, as you noted, <laughs> politically in incorrect. <laughs> uh, but let me uh, jump back to what you uh, had, had mentioned, uh, Terry, uh, about my dad's politics. Yeah. A lot of people say, well, you know, what, well, what happened to Don after Hazel, you know? Right. Why didn't he have his own series? You know, that's a question none of us will ever be able to, to answer. But clearly what took up a lot of his time was his involvement with politics. And I, I, I root him on for that. I mean, that, that was, uh, he, he, he was very conservative, and conservative values were uh, very important to him. And uh, he spent a lot of his uh, life for the next 30 years after Hazel um, you know, campaigning for for many uh, Republican candidates, uh, um, including Ronald Reagan, and, and ultimately, when Reagan uh, went into office, uh, became a Reagan appointee, as I did. <laughs> Why let a good relationship go to waste? <laughs> I, I can probably say that I've only been to one president's funeral, and that funeral was Ronald Reagan. I was there. Oh, you know, I wish I had been there. Yeah, it was it was a very emotional and, and special event. Now, I'm very surprised that you didn't go into acting. You were kind of behind the scenes, but you were, as a child, kind of a background actor and appeared in Hazel. You know, I've thought about that so many times. Uh, and I, as I, My first answer is, well, I was in the business. I was on the other side of the camera when I was <laughs> at uh, KTLA and Steve Allen's show and Paramount Television. Um, you know, in my earlier years... I was frightened to get up in front of an audience. Where I, 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 if I had to give a book report, oral book report, I, I was dead the whole day. And what is weird is, as as I progressed, and I I see it as like my dad's DNA inside me coming alive. I came to love doing public presentations or even radio shows uh, like this. So. In my latter life, all of my, uh, my career was public relations. And so I was in the federal government for six years, again, as a Reagan appointee. But in all those positions, I was a spokesperson. So I did hundreds of uh, interviews. And then when I formed my own PR firm, uh, I was a spokesperson for many uh, companies, uh, 
uh, associations and did literally hundreds of television and radio uh, interviews. I, I love it. If I had the same uh, makeup that I do now, back when I was maybe 10 or 12 years old, I probably would have become an actor. Right, right. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the various things that you've had in your life. I mean, it's great to talk about your dad, and of course we'll do more of that, but you had mentioned that you founded your own PR firm, which of course was Stratacom. Uh, you were senior VP over at yeah, Bruce Harrison Public Relations. But a couple of things that I wanted to talk about was some of the political stuff and also some of the stuff you did later in the 70s. I know that you Peace Corps for a while. You were the appointed press officer and acting director of public affairs for the U.S. Peace Corps, and you, you had other roles with them as well, right? I wouldn't, uh, e even though most of the, the uh, positions in federal government were what they call political uh, appointment, uh, they weren't political in the sense that you and I think of it. We weren't pushing Reagan, per se. Um, the, the first few, uh, actually the first position, uh, which was uh, running the West Coast office uh, there in Westwood on uh, Wilshire Boulevard, uh, uh, the Peace Corps was uh, not a political appointment. It was a uh, uh, civil service position that I had to compete for. Um, and it was mainly uh, recruiting n uh, new Peace Corps volunteers and getting uh, publicity, because at that time, this was, uh, you know, in the early 80s, uh, the director felt that, uh, you know, most people had kind of forgotten what the Peace Corps was and, right. and felt we needed a lot of national uh, attention. And uh, and the way I heard about it is that was my first, dad's first appointment in the Reagan administration. He had been appointed to the uh, Presidential Advisory Committee to the Peace Corps and was loving it. And he'd come home and we'd be having dinner and he'd be talking it up. And uh, I was in between jobs, as they say. <laughs> and and uh, he said, hey, well, you know, the... the the office in uh, Westwood, they're looking for a, a new manager. And I, I thought, wow, that'd be really weird. I always kind of prided myself from going one bizarre position to another. And and I thought, yeah, working for the federal government, that would be really, <laughs> really bizarre. And, and he said, but they're looking for somebody that knows media. And I thought, well, I've worked in the media. Right. Anyway, make a long story short, I... I applied for it and uh, as well as about 20 other people and i got it and uh wound up uh bringing the production of that office from the bottom almost to the top and and uh, but it was my first uh, try at public relations i really didn't know what i was doing but twice in a pretty short period i wound up getting uh, stories coming out of our office uh, on uh, CNN National, and wow. and so headquarters in Washington saw that and said, "Wow, we we need him back here." So that's what brought me back to Washington. You don't even hear about the Peace Corps anymore. Yeah, are they are they still going or? Oh yeah, it, it it's still there, and well, that's because I left. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> when I used to hear about the Peace Corps, we would think of it as like. Oh, that's a hippie thing. These hippies are joining that are out of Berkeley or whatever because they want to do good, and there's yeah. more to it than that, I guess. No, and uh, again, as I write in my book, I, I kind of started off on the liberal side, and in, in uh, you know at the University of Oregon, and and through my through the '70s and everything, and uh, and and then started you know reading a lot, and and I moved started moving to the conservative side. So I, when I left the Peace Corps. Um, I, I was loving it and thinking it was a great program, uh, but for different reasons that most liberals, you know, think it's a good idea. I, I viewed it as, and still do, as a very inexpensive ambassadorial uh, program to demonstrate to the peoples of the world that we're really a great country. We, we're so great we can afford to send uh, talented people into your country and help you. Right. And, and to me, that's a great message. Right. So I have to ask, you had alluded to it at the top of the interview, but tell me, Ron, tell me about Captain Disco. What is Captain <laughs> Disco? I, I, I tip my hat after being on <laughs> radio for 45 years. I tip my hat to you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'll uh, give you the truncated version. Um, I was I hit my midlife crisis when I was like 27. <laughs> 
and and that is because I didn't finish college while all my friends were still you know going to school. You know, by the time they graduated, like I said, I was the associate director of a nationally syndicated show, and uh, and just fine, thank you. And then, but you know, I went to then Paramount, and and I went to Billy Jack Productions. I won't get into that, but it's basically Billy Jack, Tom Laughlin. They kind of blew me out of the business. I said, I I really don't want to have anything to do with that anymore. And I and I I I just kind of floated for a while, and I was eating at a one of my favorite restaurants in West L.A. that's no longer there, Kelbo's, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and they had a dance floor, and some guy had two turntables and was playing uh, actually '40s uh, big band music, and I thought this is really bizarre. I've never seen this, and I'm looking at the guy, and I recognized him. It was uh, a good friend of mine from high school, and I go up and I introduce him. He says, oh, hey, what are you doing? If you're not doing anything, we need more disc jockeys. So, again, long story short, the name of the company, Captain Disco, uh, is a guy that was out of Malibu, uh, was uh, a real visionary because he had built these portable uh, disco units that are now seen everywhere at every wedding, mm -hmm. you know, with the two turntables oh, yeah. and the big sound system. He built, uh, he like had like four of them. Yeah, I've used he, those. Wow. I've used those, absolutely. That he's, he, built, he built them himself, and this was way before disco music, and so I thought, hey, that's fun, you know, and it, 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 I didn't take it seriously as a, as a career. I just thought, well, this will be fun. I, I love music. I played guitar. I had bands all the way through school. So uh, I started doing it, and I did really well. I, I was uh, the disc jockey at a place called Crazy Horse Saloon in Malibu. But then it started catching on, the whole disco thing, and, and a big four-story building uh, in Westwood is built called Dylan's Discotheque. Um, Captain Disco got that contract, and I, I, at that time, had worked my way up to become the head disc jockey out of about 40 disc jockeys. So I, I got to pick and choose what I got, and and once that uh, Dylan's was very, very popular, they built a, even a bigger one downtown, and the the attraction was, it was like a multi-million dollar investment these guys made. And so it was like a 30-foot ceiling of an old ballroom. And they put a monorail track on top. So one of the attractions at midnight, all the lights would flash and loud booms. And the disc jockey would come out flying oh, wow. above the crowd. <laughs> and so I became known as the flying disc jockey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the local ABC station did a profile on me and it, and it was great and again i wasn't taking any of this serious i was laughing all the way to the bank as my dad would say and it was just a lot of fun and i got to pick and choose various contracts now, i'll end the story by saying one of the contracts i chose was uh, uh picking up the last 10 weeks of a disc jockey that had left a cruise ship and they needed somebody to come in right away and i raised my hand and said that's me <laughs> and uh i wound up meeting my wife on the cruise she was Aww. a passenger and i was the dj i'm very surprised wow. some kind of drive-in movie didn't include you in whether films like rick d's has done or something because that, that's very well cool. actually i was included in a few things there was uh Let's see, in 77, I think it was, uh, all the ABC affiliates uh, were having a big uh, party out at Universal. Uh, I think the Universal Hilton out there, is it, or the yeah. Sheraton? Yeah. Anyway, and I still have the program. In fact, a friend, I'm looking at it right now. A friend of mine just sent me another copy. Uh, it says, Big Gala. And I'm listed along with Robin Williams and Donna Summer <laughs> as, as Ron DeFore, the flying DJ. <laughs> well, let me tell you, that that's great. Hey, I've got to ask you, uh, if you don't want to answer this question, and you kind of came off in a negative light, but that's okay, and I don't want to influence your answer. Tom Laughlin is very important to this station. We are classic TV and drive-in movie. Can I get your comments on what it was like to work with Tom Laughlin, if you want to discuss it? If not, just tell oh, me. Oh, sure, because I, I had to make that big decision in writing the book, and I decided, hey, it's my book, and I'll say what I want. Because, you know, we, we, had, uh, we had Tom's daughter on, who was in all their movies. and she, I met her, yeah. She, she said a few bad things about her dad, too, so I've heard both. 
Look, let me let me just say that uh, on the good side, I would put him in the same category uh, for excellence, and that's that's all, as Ozzie Nelson and Steve Allen. Yeah. Okay. But but only in that category. When it comes to personality and the way you treat people and every, he's nowhere near. And that's the problem. Uh, that was he's passed away, obviously. But that was the problem with Tom. Is uh, y- yes, he cr- he produced, directed, wrote, and acted in one of the greatest cult films of all time, and made seventy million dollars, uh, and, and and sued Warner and got even more money because they didn't distribute it the way he wanted to. But um, uh, that all went to his head, and so. It's a shame because uh, he uh, he threw all that money away. He created uh, Billy Jack Productions, and he did crazy things like keeping on uh, a very famous cinematographer at the time, Jack Marta, uh, at about twenty five thousand dollars a week, which is a lot of money now, but it was a hell of a lot of money back in the early seventies. And it was I heard overheard him being his. Uh, his administrative assistant, I was close to him all the time, so I overheard a lot of stuff. And I overheard him saying on the phone to somebody, I own Jack Marta. Oh. And that's the kind of ego that he had. And so he would keep him on that salary, whether they were shooting or not. And uh, you guys know the business. You don't keep your cinematographer right. on if you're not shooting. Right. You only pay him for the weeks that they're working. But he did that so he could say, I own Jack Marta. Well, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I won't get into in this interview, but, I mean, the way he treated, uh, he, he was the uh, quintessential uh, producer with the producer's couch. Let me just put it that way. Well, the thing that Teresa Laughlin said, because he didn't care, she wanted to do, <coughs> excuse me, go to college. He didn't want her to go. You're going to be in the movies. This is what you're going to do. He thought he was Billy Jack. And that was the problem. <laughs> he didn't yeah, understand no. he was Tom Laughlin. He thought he was Billy Jack. <laughs> You know, I, I can't remember the name of his son, but uh, his son, uh, <laughs> Tom bought his son a nice place right on the ocean in Malibu. I mean, like one of those right on the water. Uh, it's pretty nice to buy your own son, although I'm glad my dad never did that to me. That's uh, what I write about a lot in my book. I'm glad my dad didn't give me a lot of stuff. But anyway, uh, there was a, a point where Tom said, hey, why don't you go out and visit, and again, I can't remember his first name, uh, you know, he's, he's troubled, and, you know, maybe you can talk to him. And, and I did. I went and met with him, and uh, and I got an earful. You know, it sounds like what his daughter was saying. is yeah. that He's uh, just, just way overbearing. And and most importantly, let me just reiterate, and I write about this in my book, that many of my friends are dead now because their parents gave them everything. Right across the street from us, Anthony Caruso, uh, the Carusos, I love them. In fact, uh, Tony and Tonya were uh, my brother Dave's godparents, and their adopted son was my best friend for you know years. Well, he's no longer with us anymore because they showered him uh, and maybe it was because he was adopted and they felt they had to but i saw that uh, among a lot of my friends that were sons and, and daughters of uh, of well-to-do people in the business and you know when i had to mow the lawn uh, can you imagine mowing the lawn on mandeville canyon <laughs> when my dad was you know doing pretty well to earn money to buy my fender uh guitar when my neighbors and the other one of the guys in my band was just given uh, you know the amp and you know for it wasn't even christmas he was just given it and i hated that i god i hated that when i grew up but when i moved out uh the day i moved out and i knew the value of money the value of work um i praised my parents for from there from then on because they brought us up the right way i think your dad might have had that instilled by his dad or mom because i saw pictures in your group of which you know i love being a member of your dad out there working on the house outside oh my dad was great with wood um in fact if you dig deep enough in into the uh, don DeFore fan club i i posted a while back uh shots that we have of the various pieces of furniture that my dad uh made he had a great railroad tie table that he made and of course railroads were a big theme in the house because uh 
his dad, my grandfather, was a railroad engineer. Ah. And so he, he, uh, he, he worked with wood, loved working with wood. In fact, you'll notice there's a series of, uh, I think it's six or seven Hazel episodes where my dad's uh, ring finger is bandaged. And and I get that's the most common question I get. Why was that real or was that? It was very real. My dad almost lost his finger uh, working in the his uh, his garage because he had switched from a six inch blade to uh, a seven inch blade mm-hmm. on his tabletop and wasn't used to it. And uh, it, he almost lost his finger. Right. Well. Uh- for people that want to check it out, not only the fan club that's over on Facebook, but also I had mentioned earlier, you have a, you maintain a great website called Defor.net, and there's a lot of fun, interesting stuff over there. And with you talking about how Don <clears throat> was a great woodworker and, and worked and built stuff, am I correct in, in reading that the home that you guys, that he had in Brentwood, that they actually built that, meaning that like they designed it, your mom, who was Marion Holmes, did all of the interior direct decorating, and your dad actually built a lot of the furniture for inside of it? Uh, most of that, what you just said, is, is correct. Um, the furniture, my mom did all the interior decorating. In fact, she even made some of the lampshades. Her mother was a uh, um, had a hat store in Chicago. There's a name for that trade, and I'm drawing it blank. But anyway... Um, and so she she did all, all that, and uh, the only difference is that obviously Dad uh, kind of knew the type of house that uh, they wanted, and and that they had saved a lot of like a lot of people do. They save uh, pictures from magazines, and and then hired a great architect architect that was known for that kind of star- style. It was uh, it was. Uh, uh, like a barn and silo type of style, mm-hmm. and and uh, although it had a second floor, uh, he never built that out. It was always what us kids called the attic, and we would love playing up there. But um, it was a pretty spread out. He bought two lots uh, uh, in Mandeville Canyon, just a block up on the corner of Mandeville Canyon and Mandeville Lane, uh, which makes it one of the larger lots uh, in uh in Mandeville, certainly. Um, and uh, so I, I love that house. I have dreams about it all the time. Unfortunately, it's changed hands about uh, four times. And this latest one, Trent Resner, who now owns it, uh, who is somebody that my daughter certainly knew of a group called Nine Inch Nails. Right, right. And, and apparently he, he writes a lot of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, scores of movies now but anyway he paid 16.3 million dollars for it and uh, i keep on watching it change on uh, google earth (laughs) he's 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 now ripped he he tore down our whole uh, pool house and uh, built a look what looks like a recording studio but anyway it was a great uh, house uh, that i have great memories in And your daughter's like, Dad, I love this song so much. You're like, but he messed up my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we haven't exactly. talked enough about your mom. I guess your mom was in show business too, right? Yes, my mom uh, in the early, uh, well, early to mid '30s um, won a singing contest, which allowed her to uh, be a featured vocalist on, uh, I think it was WLS in Chicago. Uh, but shortly thereafter, she got picked up as the um, featured vocalist uh, for two different groups that she did in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, Henry Bussey uh, Orchestra, she was the featured uh, vocalist. And then in the Chicago area, Art Castle and his Castles in the Air. And she recorded with both. Uh, I, I, in the early 90s, collected all of those, uh, or most of them, uh, those songs from various sources, cleaned them up and produced a, a CD. Um, but it was while she was uh, singing uh, one Saturday night with uh, Art Castle that uh, my dad was, at that time, uh, touring the country in uh, a Broadway hit. He was actually uh, starring in 1942 in... Uh, uh, 
the male animal, which became the number one hit comedy on Broadway. And so then it started touring. And so when he hit Chicago, somebody in the in the uh, uh, the 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 play had had told my dad that, she, that he needed to look up this Marion Holmes. So it was like the last week that they were there. He said, "All right, let's go over there," and. Uh, he said hello to her, and as he always said, it was the longest hello in history. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. one last point about mom that I always like to add in is that um, most people know the song, I'm a Little Teapot. Right. Well, my mom is the one that made that famous. I actually have the uh, the record framed here in my library awesome. uh, on Bluebird Records. You know, a lot of people listening, they're asking, they're big fans of Hazel. Now, I know you had to have met her because you were on the show. Uh, tell us about Shirley Booth, because she really was a, a I say, a Betty Booth kind of character in a way, but but she seemed like a very nice person off camera. Yeah, uh, and the first thing I always say <clears throat> is that um, she was nothing like that character, and, and that speaks a lot to her acting ability. She was uh, reserved, quiet very intelligent did, and of course didn't talk that way um, and uh, we always enjoyed being with her we uh, we I really enjoyed the time we had her out at uh, the restaurant in Disneyland and and I got to be the one to take her all around uh, I, mean, I remember taking her on the Matterhorn <laughs> and, and, and it was great because you know everybody recognized her and everything but I got to show off to her because you know, at that time, I, I was able to use all the, the back uh, employee entrances and the the cuts, right. the cut-throughs. And, you know, because the park was so small in those days, they knew who the DeFore kids were. Right. So, uh, and, and the other neat thing was that all I'd have to do uh, is have my dad's pass in case they didn't know who, <laughs> who I was. Uh, and it was great, not just with uh, Shirley Booth, but any friends that I would bring. We'd get, we'd get to go to the head of the line and and then also stay on the ride as long as we wanted to. Oh, my God. Now, it, it was great hanging out with Shirley. But, man, if I was you, I'd been hanging out with the cute little actress to play Don's daughter <laughs> in, in, in Hazel because she was so cute. Uh, Whitney Blake? Yes. Oh, yeah. She, she was very attractive. Now yeah. let me let me ask you. I don't know if uh, your dad had ever mentioned anything like about this, or maybe later in life. But if he did, can you tell us what Don thought about him being replaced? Because when the show went from NBC to CBS, they wrote Mr. B off. Yeah, well, he, uh, he wasn't happy, and uh, and he was uh, least happy with the way he found out about it. He they didn't have the courtesy to call him first. He read about it in the trades, oh. and, and that uh, you just don't do that, right? Uh, you know, uh, particularly after being such a big part of the show, and uh, you know, it, it's it's just a shame. But that's the economics of it. The the ratings had started to slip and uh nbc sold it to cbs and uh my dad owned uh, and we still <laughs> have a 10 percent participation in the show so keep buying those dvds uh, um so uh you know they were not only saving then the salary of my dad and whitney blake but uh that 10 percent participation um but as i see almost on a daily basis on my uh, fan site, and I also participate on two Hazel fan sites. Everybody hates the the last ep the last season, so right. it speaks for itself. And I think it's pretty funny. I, I just had something funny pop into my head. And knowing that you work for KTLA, and we want to talk about that, I know KTLA's sister station is Antenna TV, and they play Hazel religiously. I hope we get some money out of that. <laughs> well, yeah, any of the uh, any showings. You know, other than YouTube, which you know, I could I could go on for that about how they they get around paying royalties. But uh, yeah, uh, n not only uh, Antenna, but FETV, um, Roku, 
DirecTV, Fubo TV, Crackle.com. I mean, I've made a whole list here because I'm giving a presentation uh -huh. uh, next Tuesday, and I, I, I wanted to note where uh, people could watch that. There is a huge resurgence, and, and uh, I know this, you know, firsthand. I remember uh, before my mom passed on, uh, and she still had the house in Brentwood, and I'd go out there to stay, and... and uh, you know, there were a couple of times she laughingly said, oh, yeah, let's take a look at the uh, the Hazel check that, that we got from Sony. And, you know, and it was like $9 or something. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. so uh, my brother and I, as uh, executors of the estate at when my mom passed, we didn't even think of that. And it wasn't until, uh, what was it, three or four years ago, I got a, just a random email from somebody at Sony that said, we've been looking for you guys. And anyway, make a long story short, they had been sending uh, uh, checks and and uh, correspondence to my wife, to my mother's uh, house that just, it was no longer there actually, and and uh, so they finally got me. Make a long story short, we can tell by the uh, participation uh, checks that the uh, uh, the, the family. Uh, a state gets that uh, the the popularity of Hazel just has gone through the roof. It's, it's just amazing. Would you would you say that that Hazel is more remembered than Ozzy and Harriet at this point? Because we've always thought that that was interesting. How as time marches on, you know, shows that are older obviously get forgotten faster. Um, but there are some like Ozzy and Harriet that you know every every kind of like retro channel again you see Ozzy and Harriet so which one do you think yeah. is more remembered they, they seem to show Ozzy and Harriet more for I some mean, it's reason it's on all the time oh that's surprising uh, offline send me the the links because uh, my understanding because I still uh, stay in touch with Sam Nelson uh, Ricky's youngest uh, kid mm -hmm. who just finished the project of uh uh, digitizing all whatever it is, 470 episodes. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of know the inside story why there's not as much syndication on this. So I'm, I'm surprised you all are, are saying that. Because, and the reason why is because David Nelson um, unwisely, as many people have said, uh, sold most of those episodes to somebody else on the cheap in the early 70s and once he did that, they lost all the royalties. Well, I so, think, yeah, I think there's a belief that uh, at least a portion of the episodes are in the public domain. The reason I say that is because there are certain DVD companies who only release stuff that is in the PD, and they yeah, quite often right. release Ozzy and Harriet. Right. But uh, people, ought, if they really love that show, they ought to get what uh, uh, Sam has now published through Time Life which uh, are like perfect, they'll be, they will view better than what you saw on your black and white back in those days, because mm -hmm. these are perfect digital uh, cleaned up copies. But to answer why I think the real reason is, is it's just a matter of uh, the aging of the population. There's far more people that remember watching Hazel, uh, you know, when it was on, that are alive today than are alive today, and they also watched Ozzy and Harriet. Uh, I just think it's, you know, you've got, especially the, er, the early ones, you've got like a 10-year difference. Well, there, there's a lot of Hazel merch out there, too. Uh, board games and puzzles and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but uh, anyway, so we're, we're enjoying seeing the uh, popularity of both. And what I didn't mention uh, uh, really uh, much at all is what people are now learning about my dad because of the popularity of uh, stations like Turner Classic Movies, mm -hmm. my dad was in more than 30 feature films. Yeah, right. I, and, absolutely. I was getting ready to mention that next. I love and, his work with Martin and Lewis, particularly. Yeah, and he co-starred in more than a dozen. And, and what's really phenomenal, he uh, co-starred and got uh, billing uh, above some some real greats. He he w was in uh, Charlton Heston's first film, and he was in uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis's first film, and uh, and also uh, I'm drawing a blank now, but uh, 
one other. I should Elizabeth Scott. Yeah. He was in Elizabeth Scott's uh, first film as well. So I mean, those are. In fact, my dad tells a great story about uh, that uh, film, the first film with uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, and and they were filming uh, the the first scenes, and uh, the director was going crazy because they weren't funny. <laughs> and, wow. and the, the director consulted with my dad and and said, hey, Don, you know, you're the one that said you'd seen them at this uh, comedy club on Wilshire, and, and they were killing the crowd. And my dad brilliantly said, you know what, I think it's because they don't have an audience. And, and I've never heard of this done before, but the director hired extras to reshoot the film so that there was an audience. Oh, wow. And then they killed it. Wow. <laughs> it was that's the weirdest a great thing. Story. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. Wow, that, that's amazing. Well, well, what, what is what your, I, <coughs> well, excuse me, what is your favorite uh, movie of your dad's? <clears throat> uh, that's, that's tough. But the favorite movie has become really the favorite of so many Don DeFore fans, and that is It Happened on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. Which was a real sleeper up until about four or five years ago. And I've got to give credit to a number of people on my Don DeFore fan club, and, and, and one in particular that took the lead in petitioning Turner Classic Movies, not only on that movie. Uh, but on Don DeFore in general. And I really give them credit for uh, one thing. Uh, October, not this last year, but October uh, 2019 was the first time uh, Turner ever dedicated a day to Don DeFore films. Wow. And then it was shortly thereafter that we all got notified uh, that it happened on Fifth Avenue was now going to become a regular staple of their Christmas, December uh, programming. Fantastic. We need to take that a step further, and we need to have you hosting yeah. a night of movies. Hey, listen, you know, I <laughs> am doing my homework and researching you guys and the many of people that you guys know and that you've interviewed. It, I mean, it's mind-blowing. In fact, there's one guy that I want to talk to you offline that's a good friend of mine. I just sent you an email. But... Yes, the latest thing that they've been trying to get through to Turner on is catch me while I'm still alive. Okay, so <laughs> I would I would love to be interviewed or be a co-host or something whenever they show one of my dad's films because um, I've got a wealth of stories that I think uh, viewers would enjoy. Am I the only one that's blown away at how much you look like your dad? I get that all the time. And, uh, man, you do. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, as I told a producer friend ba back in, uh, gosh, when was it? It was probably 20 years ago. There was something in the trades about Penny Marshall having uh, considered buying the rights to Hazel or something. And uh, there was something about her, you know, wanting to do a remake. And I told uh, my friend producer Warren Whiteman, I, I said, Warren, you've got the connections i don't know anymore but get in there and tell them that i want to play mr b they won't yes. find anybody that looks and sounds like you know, like Don before better than me uh but unfortunately it never came about I mean, well <laughs> there was even a moment earlier when you laughed ron and i was like wow he just sounds <laughs> just like his dad when he laughs well we want yeah. to talk about them but i don't know how the relationship with ktla is but they now own two channels that are playing nostalgia music they need to do something with you well actually they did if you go on uh my youtube channel uh i i captured and i put up uh for all generations to enjoy mm -hmm. and i'll tell you the background I, I even mention it while i'm doing this interview on, on ktla it was the beginning of my book tour and uh, at the very beginning, of before, just before signing my contract with the publisher, and they also do uh, publicity, I, I said, look, I'll be happy if I can just get an interview on the station where I started my career, KTLA. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got connections there. Well, make a long story short, all of the interviews that I have done are really my doing and knowing PR and very little uh, from the publisher side. But... <laughs> It was connections that I had with KTLA. They saw the blurb on the book. They went, oh, God, we've got to get you on. 
And so I'm just on that interview. You got to look at. It, I am just gushing because this <laughs> and, and, and what blew me away. And as I say it right at the beginning of the interview, I said, "This is unbelievable. This stage, stage six that we're sitting on right now, is the same stage where we shot the Steve Allen show." Yeah, amazing. I mean, it was it was weird and and just uh, a highlight of my career. Now I know KTLA is. is a beloved station everybody loves. That's my go-to station. It's the only news I watch. I don't think it's quite up to the standards of the way it used to be, but I still love it. Tell me about your experience with KTLA. Well, KTLA uh, was, if I had a time machine, that's the era that I would go back to. I mean, that was the beginning of my professional career. Uh, you know, I started in the mailroom. It, you know, it was just going to be, uh, you know, a summer job, and then I'd go back to the University of Oregon. But I got promoted a couple of different times. And the neat thing about, and this was early 70s, so the neat thing about it, it was, it was non-union. Uh, several of the positions I held, there's no way that you would be able to do that because uh, this was before I was 21 or uh, thereabouts, and and you know with very little experience, you can't do that uh, today. Right. And and uh, so that's my memory of and and very very family oriented. Just within a short period of working there, of course, starting in the mailroom helps because you get to meet everybody you know pretty quickly. <laughs> right, right. Um, it was it was just great just you knew everybody and they were like family uh i mean, one of the neat things was uh when i i heard that led zeppelin was going to be at the forum and ktla had all these uh, sports contracts with the forum uh, and, and nothing to do with rock concerts but i went to the sports director at ktla and i made up some bs story about why it would make sense for me to take ktla's uh, various uh, still cameras uh, to the <laughs> to the concert, uh -huh. and you know maybe we could use them in cross promotion. I can't remember what I said, <laughs> but he he read right through that. But uh, <laughs> like two weeks later, I come into my office, and on my seat is an on stage press pass wow. to the Led Zeppelin oh, concert. Wow. So I've got these unbelievable because uh, I, I got to use their uh, camera kit, which included like a 400 millimeter lens. I've I've got shots of Led Zeppelin that are just phenomenal. Now we're heard nationally. It may not mean anything to people in Texas or whatever, but to our listeners in the LA area, who's some of the on-air news personalities that you uh, pretty much got to know real well and, and may might have some stories of? Oh, uh, Stan Chambers. Oh yeah. For, oh yeah. For one, Stan was so a, fr great. a friend of the the families, and uh, uh, Cleet Roberts. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, Cleet Roberts. Uh, there's a whole side story of what my sister did, and uh, that is a book that was published about my sister uh, volunteering and going to uh, uh, Korea to work in the in an orphanage. Uh, Cleet actually flew, and this is unusual for a local station, flew to Korea to interview uh, my sister Penny uh, to do a story on her. Wow. And, um, yeah, so Cleet was a good friend. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. I, uh, I don't want to date you or, or anything like that. I don't know, like, when you were there and when you left, but I don't suppose you got to deal with or meet or maybe you met him afterwards the man that started it all, Gene Autry. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Gene was on the Steve Allen show. A couple of times. <laughs> yes. And uh, all I'll say is that uh, we shouldn't have had him on in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> had a little too much cowboy spirit, huh? <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. I wanted yeah, no, And uh, what's interesting is. Uh, as I said earlier, is I, I paid little to no attention to any of the celebrities while I was growing up because they were just neighbors. Right. Uh, as I got older, I, eh, that became a little bit more interesting. But when I was on the, uh, working on the Steve Allen show, I made it a point uh, almost every show to go into the green room and introduce myself and uh, met more stars that way than I did... Uh, growing up, and, and w one of my favorite stories is when I'm there, and this was uh, during Steve Martin's, 
very beginning of his career. I mean, he was still doing the, the arrow in the head on, on that show. And so I'm in the green room, and, and we're talking, and and uh, I mentioned my dad. And then, then I somehow got to the restaurant in Disneyland, and he said, wait a minute. When, when would you been been there? And I said, well, that would have been, you know, 57. He said, well, I was working in the magic shop. Oh. And I yeah. said, no way. I said, that's how I would spend my time, you know, <laughs> when you grow up in Disneyland, you're bored with all these attractions. I love magic, and you're probably one of the guys that was teaching me all these tricks. And and, and we connected, and it was uh, it was just marvelous. So how do we go? So as we as we kind of you got to ask those Disney questions though forget those right but, but, but as we before we wrap up here I did want to ask because your dad had a very very likable but likable face but it was almost like he was like your buddy like he was like he had that personality like somebody that you just kind of knew like the guy that you would have a beer with oh that's um, right he was in. More Ozzy and Harriet episodes. He was like on camera, like almost all the time. It was in but every episode. A, so. a lot of people would categorize kind of that persona as being, you know, oh, well, he was a character actor. He wasn't a leading man. I actually understand that he had contracts with MGM and Warner Brothers uh, actually simultaneously, but they had both dropped him because they said that he wasn't star material. How did how did Don view his career? Did he did he have any? Regrets that his career didn't go in a different direction. Uh, I think there's many actors that would say yes to, to that. <laughs> uh, uh, and and yeah, Dad. Uh, not only Dad, but uh, his agents and and uh, the more I've I've done, uh, you know, research and and I'm coming out of the out of the five kids. I'm I am definitely the uh, keeper of the flame. Mm-hmm. Uh, I. And 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 all the comments I see on the Don DeFore uh, fan club, he was highly underrated. Yes, uh, I, I can't explain why he would not have gotten you know uh, many more bigger parts. Uh, I already explained why he didn't. He wasn't that active after about 1965. It's because he was pursuing you know his own thing. He would have been open to getting something, and and uh, frankly, he did about 30 guest spots on almost every one of the series that were you know popular back then love boat you right. know uh, all those things um but um i when i do my presentations like i'm doing on tuesday i've done a dozen of them i start off on who was don before and i say you know some people may not think of him as a star but let me show after uh, after we go through this. I think you will agree he was a star. Yes. And so I start off with a photo of his star on Hollywood Boulevard. I said, "What more evidence do you need <laughs> <laughs> than a star on Hollywood Boulevard?" Right. <laughs> right. And well, and then I tell you know the story uh, certainly of of him as the president of the TV Academy. I mean that's a major accomplishment. Yes. When it yeah, comes you know, when it comes to the best neighbor, forget the guy in Home Improvement. <laughs> Your, your dad was the best neighbor ever. Yes. Uh, but, well, thank you. Yeah, and you, he did uh, do some stuff later on in years, which you've mentioned. I, I understand his last uh, acting role was in a movie in 1984, uh, Rare Breed, which ironically was actually directed by David Nelson, right? Yeah. I, 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 yes, and but it wasn't a blockbuster and uh, it's not one of my favorite uh, movies. But, yeah, it was directed by David. Well, at that point, he's like, well, I can't tell my old boss's son, no, you know, <laughs> my old <laughs> boss's grandson no, right? <laughs> I, I got to know, uh, you said that you went to the Nelson's house many times. That really was the house they used in the series, right? Well, yeah, the exterior. Um, and I'm pretty sure that... Um, well, actually, I know that the the pool that they had there was used uh, in there because you know I, I for years only remembered being an extra on one of the shows where there was some parade. I still keep on looking for the episode, but all of us, uh, the four kids, were in it because we were lining the street and there was some parade. But then uh, several years ago, I was uh, watching uh, an episode and. Uh, it was at the end of the show they're showing kids in a pool and it was their pool 
and my sister Dawn and I are in the pool with ah. the other the other Nelsons. So you were on both of your dad's series then. Uh, yeah, well, I already knew about the one uh, being in a, a parade thing. But, yes, I, I was also in the first episode of Hazel. Right, right. Now, I know that you had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the experiences with, with Walt and, and the parade and things like that. There was one particular story. I don't know if this was the same one you were referencing, but it was in regards to the Christmas parade. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can, can you share that story? Because when I read that, I chuckled, and, and I would love for you to share that with our listeners. Yeah, let me start off by saying that's one of the photos that Disney Legal did not allow me to put in the book. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> I, I, they scared the heck out of me by almost <laughs> stopping the publication. Oh, it's my because, God. Because they know our stories. Okay, Again, we, my brother and I have presented it at... Uh, the, the D23s. And, and uh, make a long story short, they, they, uh, the second time we presented, they already knew some of the stories that we told, mm -hmm. and they said, you, you can't tell all of those things that you guys, all the <laughs> shenanigans you guys used to do. Oh, my God, <laughs> really? Because, you're, yeah, yeah, well, they don't, you know, they, uh, uh, some yet, of the shenanigans I... in, include us uh, three times ha having made a brass plaque uh, a memorial to my dad's restaurant and surreptitiously placing it on the facade <laughs> of the restaurant. Good for they, you. Good they, for you. And, and the first one stayed up there for a year. Okay. <laughs> so they don't, you know, I, I can understand they don't want to encourage. But anyway, so D Disney Legal uh, went round and round uh, on things they didn't want to. Uh, allow me to do it, and and they finally said, "Well, look, Ron, you know that you've got stuff in your book here that we don't really want out there." But of course, and I give them credit, they cited the First Amendment. They said, "You know, you can pretty much write what you want, but then we can also grant you permission <laughs> or not grant you permission." And th so they held back about six uh, photos, and the one that you're re referencing, mm -hmm. Tiffany, yeah. is uh, was. Every year, Christmas uh, parades had celebrities at the top of every land. And my dad was Frontierland. And so minutes before the parade was uh, going to start, somebody yells up to my dad and says, Hey, Don, Walt's on the phone for you. So he was up on top of the Golden Horseshoe Review, and he climbs down and says, Yeah, Walt, what's up? He says, Well, did you bring your kids with you? My dad said, Oh, yeah, bring them every year. He says, you got to send a couple down to the front gate because my grandchildren haven't shown up, and I can't go through the parade without kids. <laughs> so, so I have several black and whites of my sister and I uh, sitting with Walt Disney in a ho horse-drawn carriage riding through the Disney parade pretending to be his grandchildren. Oh, that's hilarious. I would rather hear your stories that they don't want told than to see the movies I've seen where they show Walt drinking and smoking. You know? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then I understand that uh, you still have the, the the banjo, right? You still have the silver banjo sign? Well, again, I, I was, uh, for some reason, I was always the one interested in keeping my dad's uh, memorabilia, including the signs uh, from uh, Disneyland. But uh, so I've carried them, shipped them from house to house to house. And finally, in this house where I'm not moving <laughs> anymore, <laughs> I'm retiring here. Um, we've got uh, two two of these signs, and uh, one of them was just a big, huge banjo and said "Silver Banjo" on it, Don DeFore Silver Banjo. And uh, uh, even though some of my family didn't like me for this, I said, "You know what? I have been asked for years to put these up for auction in." Um, that there's one auctioneer that's like very famous for doing Disney stuff, and he had been bugging me for years. And I said, you know, they're you know they're they're supposed to stay in the family. And he said, I think I can get fifty thousand a piece for them. I said, when are you going to pick them up? <laughs> 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 and so uh, this was two years ago, and so. He had them crated up, shipped out uh, to uh, L.A. He's out there in Encino, I think it is. And they held the auction, and the one, the single silver banjo, fetched 50000 
and the other one only got up to 35. And I told him, I said, if it doesn't hit 50, I, I want it back. So I'm glad it worked out uh, yeah. because they shipped the other one back, which I think is really the better one. It's the full one that shows the menu, and it's got twinkly lights going around it. So I restored it, and it's now hanging in our dining room. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then the other one <laughs> paid for a couple of good vacations. Nice, there you go. Nice. <clears throat> well, Ron, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I encourage all of our listeners to pick up a copy of Ron's book, and you should actually get it from directly from Ron's website because then you can get an autographed copy. So you want to head over to growingupindisneyland.com. Uh, also, uh, check out Ron on Facebook, and you can join the Don DeFour fan club. You can request to be a part of that as well. And, of course, there's DeFour.net as well, which has some really really cool stuff over there images uh scans of 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 handwritten letters from politicians and things that went to to don so it's really a fantastic website and ron i want to thank you so much for joining us and spending an hour with us talking about your life your career your book and your dad and your mom well, Tiffany and Terry, thank you very much. I uh, I thoroughly enjoy talking about this subject, and uh, and I hope your audience appreciated it as, as well. Sure, they did. You gave a great interview, and I'm very up on these digital stations. I'm like the Roku, Apple TV, and stuff. There's a lot of those nostalgia ones. I'll be sure and let you know if any sneaky peeps try to put up your dad's shows without giving you a commission. Because <laughs> you got to keep an eye on. And in return, if you ever get a chance to talk to Ricky Nelson's daughter, I would love to have her on the show. Just let her know we're legit and you know pretty cool guy and, and girl. So. All right. Well, likewise, uh, make sure you get uh, my email and my contact information to Michael Berryman. Okay. Oh, okay. He was a childhood friend. I, I'd, I'd love to reconnect with him again. I will yes. absolutely get you two together for sure. Unreal. On the great. Yep. All right. Great. Thank All you. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Ron. Have a great rest of your weekend. All right. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye.